Welcome to Provisional Aspirations, a podcast exploring the psychology of religion, philosophy, and clinical mental health. I'm Jeffrey Wallace, author, religious trauma survivor, and graduate student pursuing a master's degree in counseling psychology. Join me as I indulge my academic interest in the human spiritual experience, a curiosity that I couldn't fully explore as a member of a high demand religious group. But now I'm learning out loud, and it feels great. When I was about eight years old, I remember seeing a commercial for Marmite on British television. Marmite is a savory yeast-based spread popular in the United Kingdom. Or maybe I should say that it's popular for some and despised by others. I remember the commercial showed a giant jar of Marmite avalanching down a British street while the members of the neighborhood either dispersed in terror or attempted to attach themselves to the giant condiment jar as it rolled down the street. The late American psychiatrist Thomas Satz is a bit like Marmite. People either love his theories, or they place the entire blame for the current mental health crisis in America on his shoulders. Not to mention blaming his colluding with the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, for the anti-psychiatry movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Notice this comment from author Ron Powers in his book, Nobody Cares About Crazy People, a book where he pours his heart out about the plight of modern psychiatry and his family's tragic experience with it. On page 162, he says this about Satz, and I quote, Satz was perfectly equipped to spearhead a one-man revolt against the orthodoxies of psychiatry. He goes on to say that he transformed himself into a stinging force of nature in debate or at the keys of a typewriter. No barrage of argumentation could sway him from his adamantly crafted line of reasoning, which again and again equated efforts to reach people in psychosis particularly government-sponsored efforts, with the menace of state-sponsored coercion. Powers is not alone as a critic of Satz and his theories. Thomas Satz appeared only as a footnote in my undergraduate psychology textbooks, as if the PhD authors were acknowledging some glimmer of validity in his arguments, but were somehow reluctant to give him any more than a nod. These dismissive references immediately registered on my there's something here you're not telling me about radar. So I picked up a copy of Satz's seminal work, The Myth of Mental Illness. There's much to say about Satz's theories, perhaps more than can be covered in just one episode. But notably, Satz's articulation of the connection between coercion in Judeo-Christian theology and clinical mental health keenly identifies the potential for toxic theology to negatively impact psychological well-being, a connection that spoke directly to my personal experience. Let's start with an overview of Satz's most controversial theory, summed up in the inflammatory title of his most famous work, The Myth of Mental Illness. Central to Satz's thesis is that the phrase mental illness is simply a metaphor for human suffering. Modern psychiatry, in his view, represents the medicalization of human suffering. And he compares this to historically when non-normative behavior resulting from psychological distress was religionized explained away with concepts like demon possession, sinfulness, and witchery. Similarly, in modern times, the secularization of the West has resulted in the field of psychiatry taking over where religion left off, in the paternalistic regulation of socially unacceptable behavior. He prefers to refer to the psychological distress that manifests itself in what we would call depression and anxiety as problems in living, arguing that psychiatric conditions are not viral or pathogenic in a way that a bloodborne or organismic disease is. Instead, Satz addresses how the challenges of playing by the rules of socially designed behavioral games can result in psychological suffering and manifest in conditions severe enough to bring an individual, or to have an individual be brought, to a psychiatrist's office. He also says that the emotion-laden behaviors and complaints of psychological pain from individuals in distress is really just a form of bodily communication when linguistic communication fails to address the problems in living that the individual is experiencing. And as Ron Powers identified in the quote mentioned earlier, Satz, with his libertarian leanings, even goes so far as to call psychiatry a coercive arm of the state as if the American mental health industry is doping people up, just like the world state was doing with Soma in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. 
my analogy, not Satz's. Satz also uses the word hysteria a lot. This is a rather reductive term. It's not used in the field of mental health anymore um, in favor of more precise nomenclature for psychological states that include symptoms of depression, anxiety, and mania. He also talks a lot about malingering. That is when an individual pretends to be unwell as a strategy for avoiding the challenges of adult responsibility and social functioning. Now, for anyone who has experienced the pain of seeing a family member suffer psychologically, or for those who have lost a loved one to suicide, or to those of us who have come close ourselves, sats can sound unempathetic at times, to say the least. And it's easy to get lost in these criticisms and miss the brilliance of some of Satz's arguments. One such argument that will be the focus of the rest of this episode is the implications of Judeo-Christian theology on mental health. If you've been following my work over the past year, you'll know that this is a matter that's close to my heart. I'm concerned about the phenomenon of religious trauma syndrome in newly disillusioned members of new religious movements and closed religious communities. I've also written about coercive psychology as it appeared in the religious group of my upbringing, using Robert J. Lifton's framework for ideological totalism and thought reform. But as I addressed in my book, A Voice from Inside, some of my concerns apply to Abrahamic religions on the whole. Mine isn't an argument for dogmatic atheism, nor do I suggest that everyone abandon the benign elements of religion that enable them to balance their very human need for social connection and meaning in life. My argument is that religion can, at times, enshrine psychological schemas that have significant implications on well-being, whether this is by providing frameworks for hope and purpose that some find useful as coping mechanisms, or conversely, by raising unhealthy cognition to the level of the sacred. This is where Thomas Satz shines. Chapter 10 of The Myth of Mental Illness is entitled The Ethics of Helplessness and Helpfulness, Hitting the Issue on the Head. A subheading on page 165 is called Biblical Rules Fostering Disability and Illness. He starts the section this way, and I quote, Jewish and Christian religious teachings abound in rules that reward sickness and stupidity, poverty and timidity, in short, disabilities of all sorts. Moreover, these rules or their corollaries threaten penalties for self-reliance and competence and for pride in health and well-being, end quote. Now, lest his readers get too defensive right off the bat, he does say that he's not arguing that this is the whole essence of the Bible, but he says, and I quote, the religious history of the West illustrates how, by taking one or another part of this work, it is possible to support or oppose a wide variety of human behaviors, end quote. So Satz isn't trying to make a theological argument here, but simply to draw some connections between the theology and the behavior of persons who profess to be religious and follow the rules of Christianity. He continues, and I quote, The motif that God loves the humble, the meek, the needy, and those who fear him is a thread running through both the Old and New Testaments. Man's fear of being too well off, lest he offend God and make him envious, is deeply ingrained in the Jewish religion. It is an element common to most primitive religions, that is, religions in which man conceives of God in his own image. God is like man, only more so. The deity is a kind of superman with his own needs for self-esteem and status, which mortal men are enjoined to threaten at their own peril. This attitude, which is basically a dread of happiness generated by a powerful fear of envy, is fundamental to the psychology of the person seriously committed to the Judeo-Christian ethic, end quote. Sass is here saying that because the deity of the Judean Christian religion is man-like in that he has needs for self-esteem and can be jealous at times, a power differential is created in which the penitent must submit to the more powerful player in the game, namely God. In order to avoid igniting the fear-inspiring envy of God, the penitent has to take humble and self-effacing actions. Satz goes on to apply his game-playing theory of mental illness, which I'll explain in more detail later, to the relationship between man and God. 
He says, and I quote, the power differential between the two players is crucial for it alone can account for the fear of envy. In a dominant submissive relationship, only the submissive member of the pair needs to fear arousing the envy of his partner. The dominant player has no such fears because he knows that the other is powerless to injure him seriously, end quote. So Satz is here saying that in this dominant submissive relationship, then, the possibility exists to ignite the envy of the dominant player in the game. As a result, the Judeo-Christian rhetoric instructs religionists to value poverty, timidity, and humility so as to avoid igniting the envy of God. He goes on to compare this to the situation in an oppressive marital relationship, and he says, and I quote, The open acknowledgement of satisfaction is feared only in oppressive situations. For example, by the much-suffering wife married to a domineering husband, the experience and expression of satisfaction, joy, contentment, are inhibited, lest they lead to an augmentation of one's burden, end quote. In other words, don't show yourself to be too happy, contented, or well-off in the presence of this dominating player in the game for fear that they add to your burden, ask you to do more, or dominate you further. It's a bit like at work when maybe you are laughing and joking with your coworkers, having a good time, and when the boss appears, you immediately pretend to be absorbed in strenuous work. You no longer show yourself to be happy and having a good time so that you can avoid being given any more tasks for the day. Sass continues, and I quote, The fear of acknowledging satisfaction is a characteristic feature of slave psychology. The well-worked slave is forced to labor until he is exhausted. To complete his task does not mean that his duties are finished, and that he may rest. On the contrary, it only invites further demands. Conversely, although his task may be unfinished, he might be able to influence his master to stop driving him and to let him rest if he exhibits the appropriate signs of imminent collapse, whether genuine or contrived. End quote. As a result of this power dynamic, then, Satz says, qualities associated with helplessness become actual advantages. He says, and I quote, in certain situations, these rules prescribe that when man is healthy, independent, rich, and proud, then God shall be strict with him and punish him. But should man be sick, dependent, poor, and humble, then God shall care for him and protect him. Sats concludes, it might seem that I have exaggerated this rule. I do not believe so, end quote. According to Sats, one of the most famous examples of fostering dependency and disability is in Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And in a small table on page 170 of the myth of mental illness, he compares a biblical text with its corollary, logically in his interpretation, from Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in the other column, man should be poor in spirit, an example, stupid and submissive, do not be smart, well-informed or assertive. And then the beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, his interpretation, Man should be meek, an example, passive, weak, submissive. Do not be self-reliant. The third example he gives, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. His interpretation, man should be pure in heart, that is, naive, unquestioning, loyal. Do not entertain doubt. The box is followed by an explanatory paragraph, and I quote, Stated in this form, it is evident that these rules constitute a simple reversal of rules generally governing rewards and punishment for man on earth. As a result, defects and deficiencies are codified as positive values. End quote. He even mentions Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, which, when seen from this perspective, certainly is a jarring passage from the New Revised Standard Version. There are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Here, value being placed on being emasculated. As Satz puts it here, and I quote, man's emasculation is here codified as one of the ways of courting God's love, end quote. Satz then discusses how this theology can make its way into the therapy room when an individual who is unable to care for themselves emotionally and materially and function in a sustainable way in society 
appears before a psychotherapist, for example, as Sass puts it, and I quote, much of psychoanalytic psychotherapy may revolve around the theme of uncovering exactly who taught the patient to behave in this way and why he accepted such teachings. It may then be discovered that religion, society, and parents have conspired, as it were, to inculcate this code of conduct, even though it is so tragically ill-suited to the requirements of our present social conditions, end quote. This chapter of The Myth of Mental Illness speaks to the potential of toxic theology to impact mental health outcomes. When personal disempowerment is enshrined in sacred verse and connected to an anxious attachment to a God construct, it can be particularly difficult to challenge. Deconstructing these messages, or at least moderating them by way of some sort of theological gymnastics, will be necessary if they are at the root of an individual's inability to cope and contributing to their psychological distress. Thomas Satt's discussion was particularly validating for me, as I know it will be for many other survivors of religious trauma syndrome. Of course, religious trauma results from the existential crisis of the loss of faith and the interpersonal conflict of leaving, perhaps even being shunned by, a tight-knit religious group. But at the cognitive level, thought processes may exist that stymie an individual's recovery, cognitive distortions drawn from unambiguous sacred texts. Despite the lack of empathy and dismissiveness of Thomas Sass, I've actually found that the myth of mental illness has been part of my recovery. Sass is sometimes like an indelicate but firm father, brazenly refusing to accept any sort of medical diagnosis and putting the responsibility squarely back on the shoulders of the individual who suffers. Psychological suffering is a matter of language to Sats. Complaints of psychological distress are actually due to a lack of linguistic skills when an individual is forced to complain of illness instead of communicating needs and assertively communicating to change one's social environment. And this has been repeated in other theories, such as Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, wherein assertive communication skills are taught to the client and communication modeling is performed so that an individual can learn the language skills needed that can affect their social environment and lead to beneficial mental health outcomes. So Sats isn't all wrong in his theory of language. Also, Sats' theory of game playing and how society makes rules that need to be followed. And when individuals have challenge learning those rules or abiding by those rules, that they need to be taught through psychotherapy. Sats appeals to the therapist on page 248, and I quote, this implies candid recognition that we treat people by psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, not because they are sick, but first, because they desire this type of assistance. Second, because they have problems in living for which they seek mastery through understanding of the kinds of games which they and those around them have been in the habit of playing. And third, because as psychotherapists, we want and are able to participate in their education this being our professional role, end quote. Albeit harsh at times and perhaps uninformed about the biological correlates of certain types of psychological suffering that we see around us, Sats's approach can be framed quite optimistically, giving the client hope that they can learn the language and learn the rules of the game or else find a new game to play. Thanks for joining me on Provisional Aspirations. If you like this episode, please don't forget to review. Also follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and you can even find me on anchor.fm and leave me a voice message. I'd love to hear from you.